So I have a bit of a weird situation in that I'm autistic, but neither of my parents are autistic. The person I'm married to is not autistic. My child is not autistic. Autism is genetic and I have at least three living autistic relatives. They actually lived and still do live on the other side of the world to me. I interacted with them very little. We didn't do phone calls. They were just off doing their own thing. Perhaps understandable they were autistic. And then when I was 19, I reconnected with them and I was like, oh, whatever sort of weird mental health stuff I have going on that doesn't really fit any category of any mental illness that there is, you have it as well. And obviously I know now that autism is not a mental illness, but that is how I would have thought of it at the time. And at that time I was suffering with my mental health as a result of being an undiagnosed autistic person, as many people do. But it was quite an interesting social experiment almost to grow up away from them and then reconnect and realise I had all these similarities. One of the other interesting things is I have been surrounded by people who are not autistic, but also most of them are introverted people. I relate to them in a lot of ways and they relate to me and we've always felt like we had a lot of similarities, but they wouldn't be diagnosed as autistic. So I don't know, I've done a lot of thinking about and a lot of discussing back and forth with them, like what makes me autistic and you not basically, you know, why would you not quite make the cut? With this in mind, I'm gonna go through nine signs that you might not be autistic. This video is of course not made to invalidate anybody at all. I'm hoping that it might actually end up doing the opposite for a lot of people. Note that these are signs that you might not be autistic, not signs that you are definitely not autistic. Also note that I am not a medical professional, I am just an autistic person, an officially diagnosed autistic person who has been surrounded by a lot of uh, normies, <laughs> a lot of non-autistic people. I collect them as pets apparently, I don't know. So number one, you might not be autistic if social success, so I guess I mean making friends and also being accepted by the people around you, particularly your peers, if that has all always come very easily to you, even as a child. You know, you might be on the shyer side, you might be a bit less talkative, but if, you know, getting on with the people around you always felt quite natural and instinctive and intuitive, you might not be an autistic person. For example, apparently, rumour has it, as far as he remembers, my partner just turned up on the first day of primary school, integrated himself into a little friend group, stayed in that friend group until the end of primary school, was kind of, you know, friendly with everyone else in the class as well. Whereas for me, when I first started nursery, I remember walking around the playground on my own, in my own little world, in my head, and I would do this even as I was older. I can remember doing this at age seven. I find autistic people often use words like chaotic or confusing to describe social situations. You often hear autistic people say things like they feel like everyone around them received a manual on how to interact in society and they just didn't receive it. Everyone else knows how to win friends and influence people. One thing that is important to note here is that autistic people can have friends. I hear it all too often that people have been told by their doctors, by diagnosticians, that they can't be autistic because they've had friends or because they've got married and have children. And this is just not true. I actually had it myself when I tried to get my referral and I spoke to the GP and she was, you know, asking me why I thought I might be autistic. And at one point I mentioned a friend and it was like she'd caught me out. She was like, a friend? friend? You have friends? <laughs> As if it was like unthinkable. Luckily she did still refer me but yeah she was certainly a bit suspicious of the idea that I could have had any friends and this is still an idea that permeates. It's just that maybe our road to making those friends can sometimes be a little bit rockier and a bit more of a learning curve and also we may be more likely to be friends with people who are also neurodivergent or a little bit different in some ways. Like we may make friends with people in a different age group or who are from a different cultural background. And I think that makes it easier for the other person to be like, oh yeah, we're different, you know, they're not the same as me, but that's okay because they're a different age to me. So of course they're not gonna be the same. And with your peers, they're expecting you to like the same things and to want to do the same things and to want to interact in the same way that they do. And so therefore your neurodivergence can maybe be perceived more negatively. This links quite well into number two, which is also to do with socializing. But before we get onto that, this video is brought to you by the all-in-one wellbeing app, Aura, who have sponsored the channel before. Struggling with transitions is actually a sign of autism and it's something I'll talk about a bit later. One transition that I really struggle with is getting myself into bed. And then once I get myself actually physically into bed, getting myself to sleep. And I'm still stuck on the last thing I was doing or reading and I just can't stop 
going over it in my head. Having something to listen to in these situations is so helpful. What did people do before phones? I don't know. I always gravitate towards the body scan meditations on Aura. I didn't realize how many positive like tingly sensations there are within my body at any given moment that I can zone into. But Aura isn't just meditations, they also have stories to help you relax, they have breath work, they have soothing nature sounds which I love. When you sign up to Aura they ask you to select what you're interested in so you'll only see the stuff you actually want on your account. So say you don't want CBT or prayer but you do want lots of nature sounds, music and celebrity masterclasses, you can select what you do want and just leave the rest. Also really easy to save the sounds and the meditations that you love so you can come back to the same ones again and again. You can use my link in the description to get Aura for free, completely for free, for seven days and after that you can get 25% off. My link is available to the first 500 people who use it so if you're interested, if you want to give it a go, get on it as soon as you can. Back to signs that you might not be autistic. Number two, you might not be autistic if you've never been bullied or excluded or ostracized or othered. Now this might seem like a bit of a weird one because it's not a trait. Being bullied is not a trait, it's not something that's your fault, it is something that is done to you by other people so it will depend on the type of people that you're surrounded by. Although I did feel a little bit like as a young person there was something built into me, like a sign flashing above my head that was like, target, target, please pick on me, please, I'm begging you. It just felt like wherever I went people were quite quick to single me out and you may have had that experience too if you are autistic. There are studies that show that non-autistic people, allistic people can pick up on the fact that another person is autistic very quickly, even if they're masking, even if they're trying to hide their autistic traits, they notice something slightly different about them and that difference can make them a bit hostile towards you. It's like the whole uncanny valley thing, which is a term used to describe this kind of like unsettling feeling you can get when you see robots who look you know, almost human. Obviously autistic people are not robots but we are humans, so we look like humans, but we maybe move and speak in ways that are just subtly different. Little details that people can pick up on but then, you know, because most people don't understand a lot about autism, they don't know how to categorise them and that can be kind of threatening to, you know, their lizard brain or something. There was a 2017 study that found that autistic people left less favourable first impressions and Dr Hannah Belcher found similar results in their research. Even when an autistic person is masking, non-autistic people will still rate them more harshly than non-autistic peers if they don't know they are autistic. You might be the lucky sort of autistic person who has never been bullied or ostracized or anything like that, maybe you've been surrounded by really nice people. In that case you may have been called quirky or eccentric or you know other words that can have slightly more positive connotations sometimes. Maybe sometimes people have been a bit bemused by your behaviour or have kind of laughed at something that you've done and you're not entirely sure why. For me primary school just felt like a montage of me doing something or saying something to somebody and then them turning around and being like you're weird. And I think for a lot of autistic people we kind of feel like, am I on the wrong planet? Am I supposed to be here? We feel alien, we feel othered, we feel different at a very young age. And if you can't relate to this experience then you might not be autistic. Or maybe you've just been around really nice people who made you feel like it was okay to be different. I don't know. Number three, you might not be autistic if socialising has always been like the most fun thing ever to you and you love to spend all of your time doing it basically and you would never choose, even if you have kind of hobbies, you'd never choose to do them over, you know, going to the pub to chat with friends. Perhaps if you're an autistic person who has socially focused interests you might be kind of an exception to this. And also it's important to note that autistic people can often have a lot of success socialising online and we may be quite happy to do that for hours and hours on end. It's perhaps easier to express ourselves that way and we're not kind of met with this unconscious bias in the same way when somebody isn't face to face with us. It's certainly not true that all autistic people hate socialising, that's not the case. And an autistic person who is masking, I have quite a lot of videos about masking, it's basically trying to cover up your autistic traits, they may socialise more than they would, you know, naturally choose to or want to in order to fit in and in order to kind of keep up with their peers. And that would likely be very exhausting for that autistic individual though. I think this is why often autistic people choose to socialise less frequently than an allistic normal autistic person because it can take a toll on us, it can be more exhausting. We seem to have a bit of a lower tolerance. One of my family members used to invite people round to play and would enjoy that for a bit and then would get to a point where they were like, you can go home now. <laughs> And they would just say it directly to this child, like, oh, I've, I've kind of had enough of you now. I think this is because socialising can feel like juggling a lot of different 
threads of information for us. So if you've seen my video on monotropism, which is a theory of autism, of how autistic minds work, basically autistic people prefer to kind of spend their attention resources on fewer things, but at a higher intensity. Social situations require a lot of different stuff, a lot of bits and pieces. In order to have a successful social situation, you may need to be very conscious of eye contact, of body language, of tone, of facial expressions, both your own and the other person's. You need to listen to them, but then you also need to be thinking about what you're gonna say next. And you also need to be thinking about when to say it because you don't want to interrupt and be perceived as rude, but you're not sure when they're gonna finish talking. Many autistic people talk about like, I can either make eye contact or I can listen to what you're saying. It's very difficult for me to do both at the same time. So to an autistic person, I think socializing can often feel like juggling. And this might explain why we kind of need a break sometimes and this can be a similarity that we share with introverted people but maybe for slightly different reasons. Number four, you might not be autistic if you've never been told that you speak weirdly. I don't think every autistic person would necessarily relate to this one but many of us have been told that we speak in monotone or the flow of our speech is just a bit strange or our choice of language is a bit odd. There was a discussion on my discord server about how many of us growing up were kind of made fun of because we sounded too posh maybe for the area that we were living in. I used to dread reading out loud in class because I was often told that I was posh. Sometimes we might have a bit of an like, unusual hard to place accent. Our vocabulary and our word choices might seem out of place, they might seem too advanced for our age if we're maybe hyperlexic and very interested in reading. Vocabulary has definitely always been a thing that's been very important on the kind of autistic side of my family and one of my family members as a very young child instead of saying that they felt sick they would say that they were feeling bilious <laughs> as a tiny child. <laughs> we might be less likely than our peers to choose language that is trendy and instead choose language that we feel is most appropriate for what we're trying to express. And we also might speak more quietly or more loudly than other people. So if you can't relate to any of this, you might not be autistic or you might be autistic, but let me know your story. Does anyone think the way you spoke was weird? Number five, you might not be autistic if you don't stim. So stimming is short for self-stimulatory behaviors. It's often associated with movements, but it can involve any of the senses. It's kind of doing something repetitively in order to self-soothe or help you concentrate or just because it feels nice. You don't necessarily actually have to be somebody who stims a lot in order to be diagnosed as autistic. This falls into the restricted and repetitive behaviors section of the diagnostic criteria for autism. You actually only need to have two out of four of these. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're not autistic if you don't stim, but it might do. But also interestingly, a lot of people who are not autistic stim as well. It just seems to differ a lot from person to person. In my own life, I've observed that my husband stims quite a lot, but my mom and my stepdad are not particularly fidgety people at all. My mom definitely, like I just can't imagine her doing any sort of fidgeting really. It seems really odd to me. Stimming is a great example of one of these instances where people say autistic traits are human traits. Autistic people are human, believe it or not, even if we feel like aliens sometimes and humans sometimes like to self-soothe by moving their body. I mean, dancing is stimming. What the hell is dancing when you think about it? It's really strange. You know, we just move our body to a piece of music because it feels nice. And that's why we stim because it feels nice. So I think even if you're not autistic, you may be able to relate to how stimming feels on some level. There are some stims that are more typically associated with autism though, like hand flapping or flapping objects, finger flicking like that, rocking, excessive spinning. In terms of vocally, a lot of autistic people perform something called echolalia where we repeat something that somebody else has said. I did this quite a lot as a young child. <laughs> Or autistic people might just repeat the same phrase again and again, or like sing the same line from a song again and again. I do this so often. I have some family members who do this so much, like they actually end up telling themselves to shut up. And I do this sometimes as well, actually. I'm like, oh, I've had enough of your voice now, Meg, please be quiet. But some autistic people do have more subtle stems and this may be just because they like the more subtle stems, or often this can be a result of the fact that they've tried to adopt stems that might be less effective and don't 
feel as nice for them but are seen as more socially acceptable. So for example, biting your nails, touching your hair, clicking a pen, tapping your foot. So it's really difficult to kind of separate what is an autistic type of stim from a not autistic type of stim. I think non-autistic people can stim for very similar reasons as well, to help with their concentration and to reduce anxiety. My husband is not autistic but he's quite a fidgety person. His stims are often jiggling his leg, bouncing a football, a soft football off the wall while he's cooking and he's waiting for things. He likes to do that. He doesn't particularly like to stand still. Apparently this is partially because it grosses him out when he hears his own heartbeat, he said, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. One thing that I do think differs between us and the way that we stim, other than the fact that I do like to flap objects and flap my hands and rock back and forth and you know some of the quite stereotypical autistic sims that not every autistic person will do but are more associated with autism. But for me it really helps with my concentration, like helps me to zone in, like completely tunnel vision on something. It can also bring me into this kind of floaty state of euphoria where I'm very creative and my focus is extremely heightened which I think is more of an autistic thing. This might be one of those cases where it is just a normal human trait to stim but the volume's turned up a little bit for autistic people. In this study, autistic and non-autistic adults accounts of sensory experiences and stimming. In answer to question four, when you feel like you're getting too much input from your senses, do you do any stims or repetitive movements? 86.3% of the diagnosed autistic adults said yes, 91.4% of the suspected autistic adults said yes, but 52% of the non-autistic adults said yes. So it was still quite a lot of people who were not autistic did say they would stim or perform repetitive movements in response to getting too much input from their senses. I just think maybe for autistic people we find more environments overwhelming so we may kind of need to lean on stimming more often than a non-autistic person would. This links in with number six. You might not be autistic if you don't have a history of noticing things in your environment that other people do not. This can be sounds. You may notice a lot of small sounds. When I was in college I would always go and work in this library that we had. It was just a room set up with desks and exam conditions. By this point I had figured out how to make friends and how to mask better. I would run away to this library to kind of give myself a break because I did find it exhausting. It was supposed to be silence and it mostly was silence but unfortunately because it was silence there was a lot of small sounds that became kind of amplified and very very noticeable. People sniffing, people turning pages, people coughing, people clearing their throats, people dropping their pens. It all felt very very loud and very distracting to me and I would instantly kind of be ripped out of what I was trying to concentrate on and be kind of frustrated by those noises. So instead I would put in my earphones and I would blast music which usually at home I would never do because I feel like the lyrics would kind of break my concentration but it was preferable to having these little sounds because I suppose the music is more consistent so I kind of I knew what was coming next whereas you know somebody coughing it's just jarring and sudden and I just met my husband around that time and I messaged him and I said oh my gosh there's too many people sniffing in the library some sort of complaint text and I don't know what he said at the time whether he kind of like went along with it or whatever but he's later told me he remembers that and he remembers thinking he has no idea what I'm talking about because he doesn't feel that way and I actually didn't spend that much time with him when I was at college because he would always be with this group of friends in the canteen and that was just very very loud to me like lots of overlapping sounds and people clanging cutlery and stuff like that and I found that quite unbearable. So you may find yourself bothered by sounds that other people don't notice. It can also be with smells as well. This is a big one for me. Wherever I am, I'm always like, it stinks and people are like, can't smell that. Visually, I also feel like I'm quite in tune to my environment. Everyone's sensory experience is relatively unique, but it is quite a common autistic experience. It's really funny to me that now that I'm part of the autistic community often, you know, a lot of the autistic content creators online, you see them wearing headphones all the time and things like that. And that was me well before I knew I was autistic. I just, if I was doing chores around the house, it was easier for me to concentrate and kind of be in the moment of what I was doing, even if that was just hanging washing. If I had headphones on, sometimes not even playing anything, just sometimes to kind of dampen the sound. Also, sometimes the opposite might be true though for autistic people, and we may seem kind of oblivious to our environment if we are very, very deeply focused in what we're doing. For example, there are videos of me as a child playing with dolls in my doll's house, and my parents would ask me a question, and I wouldn't respond because I probably didn't hear them, I was just in my own world, so sometimes it can seem like we're ignoring you if we are deeply absorbed in a task.
But again, these kind of sensory differences, they're just one example of a restricted and repetitive behavior out of four. You only need to have two to meet the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. Number seven, you might not be autistic if you have hobbies and interests, you can have hobbies and interests, maybe you don't have any, but if you do, you still might not be autistic if they're not abnormal in intensity and or focus. Often within the autistic community, I kind of see jokes about like, what do neurotypical people do all day? You know, what do non-autistic people, what do holistic people do with their lives? They have no interests, they just sit and watch TV all day. I don't mean that's completely fine and valid. People can do whatever they want with their free time. We live tiring lives. If you wanna watch TV, watch TV. And I do know not autistic people in my life who do enjoy you know just doing their daily chores and watching a bit of tv and socializing and going out for meals and going to the pub and that sort of thing but on the other hand I also have a lot of non-autistic people in my life who do have interests my stepdad had a phase where he was into welding, he spent a lot of hours learning Japanese, my mom is an artist, my husband is into playing video games and he also really likes football. Obviously just having an interest or a hobby doesn't necessarily make you autistic. Again having intense interest is just one example of a restricted and repetitive behaviour but I think what makes an autistic person's interest different, you have to kind of ask yourself that when you are in the zone of doing this thing that you love doing, how do you feel? <laughs> when somebody interrupts you? Do you get frustrated or irritated or is it kind of distressing and upsetting to you to pull yourself away? Does it feel like pulling yourself away? Is it hard to do? And then if you do have to step away from it, does your brain constantly churn and do you find that it takes you a significant amount of time to kind of switch off from that thing. Do you remember to eat and drink when you're into doing this thing? You know, my mom, she loves what she does, but my mom always was confused by me because, you know, I'd be sat at the computer doing whatever I was interested in at the time, whether it was playing The Sims or doing some video editing, and she'd, you know, make me a cup of tea and I would forget about it and let it go cold. She was like, it's so weird, like you'll never go up to get yourself anything to eat or drink, you'll never stop. And she couldn't relate to that because she'll always get up, you know, to make herself a cup of tea or a hot chocolate. And you know, potter around and do little bits and pieces. And once I'm doing something, I can often get kind of stuck there. And I think that can be one of the major differences. Autistic people will usually have been told they're very intense or obsessive about the things that they love. Notice here that autistic special interests don't have to be abnormal in topic in terms of what they're focused on. I was reading this really interesting piece from 1991 from the British Medical Journal. And it said that people with Asperger's will have rigid sterile interests such as electrical circuitry or bus routes which cannot be shared with others. They cannot, it's just impossible. There's no one else on the whole earth who could possibly be interested in these things. And I say so often that autistic special interests can be anything, it's not the topic, it's the intensity of focus that's important. And I go on and on about it because I think this sort of attitude that people used to have has prevented so many people from being diagnosed. And autistic special interests can be anything. It can be, you know, the same thing that everyone else in your peer group is interested in. Everyone might be interested in a boy band, you might also be interested in that boy band, but you might be really, really, really interested in that boy band. There's quite a lot of autistic people who mention having a special interest in the TV show Friends and things like that. There is this impression that autistic interests are often sterile and it's about filing away facts in your little filing cabinet brain sort of thing and they all have to be STEM related. And autistic special interests can certainly be what other people might consider sterile. And that's fine and that shouldn't be stigmatized either. And I think thanks to the internet, many people who do have those interests can now kind of find a community for themselves and chat to other people who have the same interests, which they couldn't do in 1991. But also autistic special interests can be collecting things. Special interests can be engaging in a hobby or it can be learning as much information, squirreling away as many facts as you possibly can about a particular topic or it can be doing all three. Number eight, you might not be autistic if you would describe yourself as a very easygoing, go with the flow, low stress sort of person. Someone who's happy for other people to turn up unannounced and change plans that they've made on a whim. You know, autistic people will often, I'm sure it's not true for every single autistic person, but we often, you know, if you say you wanna do something at seven, we might get it in our heads that we're doing that particular thing at seven. And then it can be very difficult for us to kind of pivot and be like, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. The plans have now changed. If you do have an ADHD diagnosis as well as autism, you may kind of enjoy an element of impulsivity. So that may kind of override that sometimes, but we can often be 
quite rigid thinkers. I feel like this is difficult for me to admit about myself, but we can be, and we can be quite black and white about things, particularly when I was younger, I do think I've got better. I feel like one of the ways that autistic people often manage anxiety is by controlling their day in some way. And for some people that might manifest in having these very rigid routines, which are kind of almost a stereotype of autism at this point. And there was somebody on a recent documentary with Chris Packham who needed to do everything in their routine to the minute and that was how they managed their daily life was making sure they never fell off this routine and it was highly stressful for them if anything kind of went wrong throughout their day. Their interest was football. They were not somebody who would have met you know, this 1991 stereotype of autism, which is really interesting. It's funny, like so many of us meet the stereotype in some ways, but then completely not in others. We're all just so different. For me personally, I find routines can make me feel quite claustrophobic, whereas for other people, they might give them a sense of control over their life. For me, they sometimes make me feel, even if it's a self-imposed routine, like that control is being taken away from me. I'm okay with not having a rigid routine every day, but I do have rough steps that I like to do and that do help me to feel Feel mentally well and I also just like to be the one to choose what I do with my time. I've always been self-employed and I hope I always will be. In a way I think my dislike for the rigidity of other people's routines is maybe also me kind of being rigid in a way and saying no I prefer to do things my way and on my own schedule sort of thing. My husband is introverted and he doesn't necessarily find going out to work and interacting with the general public easy and he wouldn't always say it's his preferred thing to do but he's quite easygoing, laid back, chill, relaxed and he can just get on with it. I don't know, I sometimes feel like I'm like clenching my fists and my knuckles are white, you know, like I'm trying to stay in control of my life so intensely. I don't know whether autistic people ever really have all that much chill. I try my best, but like the reality is like, no, I'm not a chill person and I don't really relate to a lot of the neurotypical people around me. I feel like they have more of an ability to adapt and shift and accept things that I would find unacceptable, if that makes any sense. And number nine, as I said earlier, when I was talking about aura, you might not be autistic if you have no problem with transitions. So you might have heard of something called autistic inertia. For example, when you drive somewhere, it may take you a while to get out of the car, even if you're at home. <laughs> it can be really difficult. I'm always the last one to get my stuff and get out of the car. And I was always the last person to leave a classroom. It took me ages to pack up my bags. It's really difficult for me to stop what I'm doing at nighttime and get Get into bed. It's really difficult for me to transition out of bed. So if you're somebody who finds it easy to pivot from one task to another, even if that task is as simple as just going to the toilet when you're in the middle of doing something else because you've just realized that you need the toilet. For me, it can be quite a job and it can involve quite a lot of mental gymnastics for me to untangle myself from something that I'm doing and to get myself to go to the toilet. Again, interruptions. So when you're focused on doing something, even if it's not like a special interest, just anything, being into interrupted can be very, very jarring to us. This is something that we share with ADHD as I think as well. You can sometimes react quite grumpily to somebody if they interrupt you. Like if someone came in now and started talking to me while I was on the track of filming, I'd be like, you want me? What are you doing? What do you want? <laughs> because it kind of feels like it gives your nervous system a like jolt or like, oh, it can feel very distressing, I would say is a good word for it. Some people might even say kind of painful. It's like my mind just gets quite happy and settled in a particular environment, in a particular situation, and then I just kind of don't want to leave it. And often it will have been really difficult for me to get myself into that place. And maybe that's sometimes part of the reason why I don't want to pull myself out of it. Cause I know like, damn it, I spent so much mental resources just getting myself here. Just like, let me be here. When I look at non-autistic people in my life, this doesn't really seem to be an issue for them. I mean, a lot of people can get frustrated if they're interrupted, particularly, you know, if they're on a tight deadline say, or if they they're getting interrupted repeatedly and it can depend on you know the importance of the task that they're doing but I suppose for autistic people often the task that we're doing can feel very important and take up you know all of our mental energy so we don't have anything spare for those pesky interruptions but my mum is so much better at cleaning than I am because she can just move from one task to another like I'm doing the sink now I'm doing this blah, blah, blah. and then my husband he's great at going to fetch my son from school he's always perfectly on time he can just be like oh I'm gonna stop now 
now because it's time to go. Whereas for me, if it's just me who needs to go and fetch him, it's very, very difficult for me to pull myself away. And I often end up kind of running there to try and get there on time. And I feel kind of mentally hungover, like my brain is still going round and round on the previous task that I was doing. And even, you know, once I've got back home with my son, I sometimes still don't feel present in the moment. And I still feel like my brain is on what I was doing before I went to fetch him, which can be quite frustrating. This is linked to this, you might hear the word perseveration used quite a lot to describe autistic people, this like being stuck on a particular loop, coming back to the same topic again and again, talking about the same thing to people again and again. The interruptions thing is just one thing that's mentioned as an example of a restricted and repetitive behaviour on the DSM-5. Doesn't necessarily mean you're not autistic if you don't relate to this. As I've said throughout this video, if you're an autistic person who masks a lot, that might be why you identify more with the non-autistic examples that I've given. So I will leave my video about four different types of masking linked on screen. And I also have videos doing the cat cube which is a masking test to see if you are potentially somebody who is masking autism. I did that test and asked my mom, who's not autistic, to do the test and I was just blown away by our differences in scores. And if you've run out of things to watch on this channel, if you've seen it all already or you've seen all the things that you care about, then I do have a Patreon. You can sign up for four US dollars a month, that's how much the lower tier is, but even on the lower tier you still get two exclusive videos every month and access to a beautiful Discord community called the Antisocial Club with a load of lovely neurodivergent people. Finding out whether or not you relate to other neurodivergent people can be a great way to discover whether you're autistic or not and can really help with that imposter syndrome. If you'd like to try out Aura then please do click the link in the description. Remember only the first 500 people to use the link will get Aura completely free for a week and then 25% off after that. Maybe it'll help you with your bedtime transitions like it does for me. Thank you so much, bye!